Hello, and welcome to How I Built This Resilience Edition from NPR. I'm Guy Raz, and this is where we're talking with entrepreneurs about their businesses and how they're building resilience in these challenging times. Before we begin, I want to thank NPR sponsor Square for their support of this episode. 2020 has reshaped business practices across the world in Square's new podcast series, Talking Squarely. Square brings together independent businesses to share their perspectives on some of the most pressing issues impacting their lives and livelihoods, like financial survival during coronavirus, and how to market a business safely. New episodes are released every other week. You can listen and subscribe to Talking Squarely wherever you listen to podcasts. So thank you, Square. Okay, my guest today in the window next to me is Father Greg Boyle. Father Greg is the founder of Homeboy Industries in Los Angeles. It's a a gang intervention, rehabilitation, and reentry program. It's a legendary program. If you've been to LAX airport, you've probably seen uh, their bakery. Um, It's actually the largest program of its kind in the world. Father Greg founded the organization in 1988 after years as a Jesuit priest and then pastor at Dolores Mission Church in East Los Angeles. Father Greg, welcome to the program. Great to have you. It's great to be here. Thank you. Um, And if you are watching via Facebook or Twitter or LinkedIn or YouTube, please submit any questions for Father Greg about nonprofits, about social enterprises, about mass, about anything you want, religion. Uh, we're taking your questions for uh, for Father Greg. So first, um, Father Greg, for those who, who are not familiar with Homeboy Industries, um, can you just um, tell us a, a little bit about what you do? Uh, well, we're quite large in about 15,000 folks a year walk through our doors trying to reimagine their lives. We were begun, as you said, in 1988. Uh, just in, in my parish, which was the poorest in the city, but it had the highest concentration of gang activity. We had eight gangs at war with each other. And I started to bury kids. I buried my 283rd last week. Wow. Not all from that community, obviously, but I know a lot of gang members. So I get asked. And, and so we just started things. We started a school. Then we started the jobs program, trying to find felony-friendly employers. And then That was not so forthcoming, so we started uh, businesses. Uh, Homeboy Bakery was the first in 92. So, um, and now we have nine social enterprises, but it's also a program of healing. And, um, you know, so there's tattoo removal, there's therapy, case management classes. So uh, a healed gang member uh, won't go back to prison. An employed one sometimes does, and an educated one sometime does but that's our contention and our our guarantee really is that a healed returning citizen or or gang member won't go to prison um it's an amazing um series of programs and as you mentioned i mean things like tattoo removal or just helping people kind of re-enter society after um, being in gangs or being incarcerated um, and obviously while it's changing, many employers um, are still reluctant to hire people with uh, felony records. And I know that's, again, that's changing. But but in response to that, you created your own businesses. Um, aside from the bakery, which is probably the best known uh, because it has locations in Los Angeles, tell me a little bit more about some of the other social enterprises that Homeboy Industries um, has, has launched. So at our headquarters, we have Homeboy Bakery, uh, Homegirl Cafe, and Homeboy Homegirl Merchandise. And then we have the restaurant at uh, the airport, the City Hall. We have Homeboy Diner, the only place to get food at City Hall. Uh, Farmer's Markets, we have a thing called Homeboy Grocery where we sell chips, salsa, and guacamole and and a variety of grocery stores. Homeboy Recycling, which is a recycling uh, e-waste, which is quite a a extensive uh, business and growing. Homeboy Silkscreen and Embroidery, that's been around for like 27 years. Wow. Um, wow. It's supposed to be nine in there, so uh, I don't know how many of that That's was. a lot. That's a lot. You know, um, I was I was telling you earlier before we went live um, that I first saw you profile in 60 Minutes, in, I think in the late 80s or early 90s. And I grew up in, in, in Los Angeles. You're such a legendary figure there. Um, you've been awarded the California Peace Prize. And... Um, you know, I mean, you're a, you're, you know, you're a priest at the end of the day, like you're a priest. You, 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 you we we're just talking about how you still um, do mass, um, obviously socially distant for, um, for, for, for people who are incarcerated, but um, you're also an entrepreneur. Um, do you, do you, I mean, did you ever, 
did you consider yourself as an entrepreneur when you founded this organization? Do you think of yourself that way now? No, I would never say that. And, uh, and certainly my board would never co-sign on the notion that I know anything about business. And so I don't really see it that way. But we were always responding to whatever. You know, if tattoos had become a, an obstacle and gang members wanted them off, we started that. And, 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 and all, even in terms of our businesses, they were all kind of haphazard. You know, there was no business plan. There was an abandoned bakery across the street from our school, our parochial school, and a movie producer named Ray Stark, you know, uh, after the unrest in 92, wanted to help. And I said, well, okay, I, I don't know, buy this bakery. It has ovens. They don't work. You could fix them. We could put hair nets on enemy rival gang members. Well, that was the entirety of my business plan. So I think... <laughs> I think everything else kind of operated on the, in the same way. There was a couple from the parish who wanted to start Rodriguez silk screening. And I said, well, don't start uh, homeboy silk screening. And, and so that's how that was born. So, you know, it wasn't like uh, some big master plan. And it was all kind of accidental. You know, it, we have the thing called the Global Homeboy Network, which is, uh, you know, 300 programs in the country and outside kind of uh, born – and, and modeled on our methodology, but you know, and they all want to start a social enterprise and, and they all want to do food, which is, I always say don't, but you know, because food is hard. Yeah. Restaurants are really hard, but there's yeah. a sexiness to a bakery and a cafe and it's hard to talk people out of this, but you know, I always tell them, you know, do silk screening because everybody that's recession proof. Everybody wants a t-shirt uh -huh. or their, their family reunion or their 5k race and they'll go with you even if it's more expensive because it's kind of the Paul Newman feel good um, you know it's like yeah it, it costs more but it, yeah. it it helps employ felons you know so and I mean you literally have rival gang members formerly rival gang members working together um, baking baked goods yeah, I mean that's kind of the byproduct of the the whole thing. You know, it's like we'll we'll hire you in our eighteen month training program, but you're going to have to stand next to a guy you used to shoot at as you make croissants in the bakery. So, wow. um, so it has it's like a threefer. You know, it's money in your pocket. You can feel good about yourself, and you and you cannot demonize people you know, and so you get to know people. And does that always work? Yes, always. I can't think of a single exception in, in 32 years. Wow. Um, Father Greg, you mentioned Paul Newman, and you know um, that really was an early social enterprise, Newman Zone, which is still around. I think they, they donate 100% of their proceeds to charity, and that was, their, that was their, their, how they operated. It was a, a, an incredible business. It continues to be. Um, you started social enterprises before lots of people talked about them. Now, you know, many, many for-profit businesses describe themselves as social enterprises. Um, you know, uh, many of them are actually social enterprises. Um, is, is it, I mean, do you think that it's easier in a sense to, to make that kind of business work when, when the mission leads, when, when, the, when it's about mission rather than profit motive? Yeah, I think so. Although, you know, the, the caveat like with Newman's own is it has to be high quality and, and nobody's going to buy something that doesn't taste good. Yeah. And they'll pay more if they know that in that case, all the proceeds go to help people. And the same is true with us. You know, people will come to us and say, I want to print up shirts, for example. And then, the, you know, we give them a price and they go, whoa, I can... I can get this for three cents a shirt. You will, well, go do it. You know, go to a sweatshop, you know, but that, this is who we are. We pay a living wage and people are trying to, you know, get on with their lives, give us your business or don't. But, but in the end, people like to feel good about what they're doing and, and they'd be willing to pay as long as the quality is high and it's reasonably priced. They're willing to pay more if they know it's going to make a difference in the world. And so, um, you know, that's kind of the principle. 
I think that's a really important point, right? Because the, it, I've, I've been to the bakery. Um, it's terrific. Um, it's really high quality uh, baked goods. So you, you can tell that high quality ingredients are being used. Um, but then there's the story there. And so you actually get much more out of it than just the food. You're, you're actually consuming a story too. Um, and, and has that been um, a, an important part of, of your, I hesitate to use the word strategy, but, but the strategy in, in, in making these businesses sustainable? Yeah, all our strategy is an evolving thing. You're always backing your way into strategy. And, yeah. and, and yet, you know, it, it, again, it, if, if the driving force is to become successful, then um, I, I think that's you're you're doomed, and I, I kind of agree with Mother Teresa who says we're not called to be successful, we're called to be faithful, and so at Homeboy we just you know keep our heads down, and we do the thing that we believe is good and true and right and just, and oh well you know whatever happens happens. Yeah. Now you know I think it, we've also been successful, but but it, that isn't the engine. You know, the engine really is, let's do the right and good and just thing. And, and, and somehow it's worked out. And, and whereas we're 32 years old, the first 10 years were marked by death threats, bomb threats, and hate mail. And so uh, not, not from gang members, of course, but from people who would demonize gang members. So why are you helping the enemy, basically? And so we had to change that before people would, you know, send us money to help us continue or buy our products. And so, you know, we still have a long way to go. I just got a text message from, we're an 18 month program. So they finish our program and then we find them employment. And we found this guy really a good job at a Walmart warehouse. And uh, he just said, they just escorted me out because there's a secondary process to, you know, where you check people's records and stuff. And this guy has a, a wonderful guy, just a wonderful guy. And you're lucky to have him as an employee. But, and he was approved, he was given the job. And then, you know, for some reason this morning, the badge went off hmm. and he had to be escorted because they did a secondary review of his record. Yeah, well, like all of us, he's a whole lot more than the worst thing he's ever done. And it's like, how are we gonna make progress? Yeah. If somebody is given a life sentence, even though they only did five years in prison, yeah. you know, it's like I said, come back to us. I don't know what to do, but it's just we're not there yet, yeah. but we're better than we were 25 years ago. Yeah. You know, I know that um, uh, you are a Jesuit priest, so talking about profit or financial models is not part of your <laughs> Your clerical training, but I, but this is a business show, so I want to ask you a business question, and I hope you'll indulge me. Um, I know you've got about 175 staff members. You have an annual budget of about 19 million dollars. Um, can you can you kind of walk us through how Homeboy Industries is structured and how the organization brings in revenue to 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 remain sustainable? Yeah, we're like 22 million dollars. Oh, wow, and uh, so about half of that comes from our businesses, and the other half we have to raise, which is a heavy lift by any means, you know? So as soon as we've raised $10 million, we have to go back and raise it all over again. And so we have a, a great many more employees than that. I, you know, I, I, we have, that's as many uh, senior staff as we right. have. Right. And uh, so we have senior staff and we have core workers, our, our, peop our homies who have gone through the program, but they're, you know, they're good bakers and, and they can teach the younger folks, the newer folks. And so, so that we have core and then we have uh, all our uh, trainees, which is like a 300 number at this point. And then we have all our part-timers who are uh, kids released from probation camps who are, uh, you know, working part-time and many of them are in our, our school. So, um, yeah, it's a heavy lift, you know, but there's, it's a training program. So nobody has any illusions that somehow we won't have to raise money. Right. We really do. And, uh, and we were really so grateful to be recently given this, the Hilton humanitarian award, which comes with two and a half million dollars. So that's greatly helped us. So, yeah. 
but it's a heavy lift. There's no way around it, you know, and, and so, um, but that's not a failing of the businesses. Some are more profitable than others. And, and we hope at some point to have just a, a straight out profitable business that will pump more money into the nonprofit piece, you know, the training piece. And training people to go off and start their own businesses and their own enterprises, which I know people, um, you know, people who've been to the program have have gone on to do. Um, w- one of the the ideas you had when you talked about this in, in a TED talk you gave was um, uh, was Homeboy Plumbing, a plumbing service, which was not successful, did not work out, um, which is important. You've got to try things and they may fail. How do you how do you evaluate which social enterprises to pursue? Like if you're thinking about a, a new idea now where what do you look for yeah that well that was a tough one because you know people come to us and so the two great guys again you know who were starting their own business you know lopez plumbing and so the and they were graduates of loyola marymount university so there was a kind of a a jesuit connection there and terrific guys so it was homeboy plumbing you know but who knew Uh, people didn't want gang members in their homes you know so it was not very successful and and it became a black hole. And so at some point the board went, oh no, 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 we gotta stop this. So that happens, but you don't really, you know, you back into things. You know, people will say, this seems like a good idea. What's the worst that could happen? It could fail, you know, so so big deal. So um so I'm I'm personally not very big on let's plot this one out. You know, you go with your gut and but you know, I'm not the CEO of Homeboy anymore, so so I have a, a, a wonderful business person who has lots of experience. So, it, you know, his gut is better than mine, and so he kind of knows uh, this this could work or this might not. So we're always exploring new ventures because uh, God knows the demand is high. Yeah. And, and people, especially right now, you know, they're releasing all sorts of prisoners from the state prisons, and they just uh, released 5,000 from the L.A. County Jail, and they all come to Homeboy. So, wow. Um, wow. All right, let's talk about the pandemic. Um, you know, so much of what you do is around food and food service. Um, when you realized in March that this thing was going to be real and was probably going to shut things down for some time, uh, probably didn't realize how long. Um, What were some of the decisions that you had to make, your organization had to make to weather the storm, to to be able to continue to support all of these people who are in this program and depend on it? Well, as I mentioned before to you, the the Homeboy Bakery and Cafe at LAX Terminal 4 has just reopened. I think it was last week. Wow. And that's after all these many months. The Homeboy Diner at City Hall has yet to open. And uh, but we were so fortunate because we were our pivot was immediate um, in the Homegirl Cafe and catering and the bakery. So we were immediately uh, got these contracts with the city, county, and with um, the World Central Kitchen, which was started by Jose Andres, mm-hmm. and. Um, and so now, you know, we're 17,000 meals a week, which is just, I think we're up to like 200,000 meals so far. And, you know, that's really kept us alive and we haven't laid off anybody, which is kind of remarkable, you know. Uh, so, so people are, so it's not just preparing the meals, it's this mechanism of delivery to homeless and, and addressing food insecurity in our county seniors, uh, shut-ins. So it's, it's been kind of a, a remarkable turn, uh, and we've been fortunate uh, to be able to make that pivot so successfully. Um, as you know very well, I mean, the, the pandemic has, has, has particularly hit um, communities of color hard. Um, a lot of Latino communities in Los Angeles have been hit harder than other communities. Um, how, how have you been able to, I mean, What's been happening with with folks who've been through your program that are involved in in homeboy industries? Um, I mean, I, ha, how have you been able to support or even maybe even even protect protect them during this time? 
Well, like everybody, we were probably shut down for the first two months, maybe. But we've been open since then. We're, we've been designated by the mayor as an essential organization. So our protocols are quite strict. You know, if they take the temperature, there's a series of questions. Everybody has to wear a mask and everybody is distant. So the only thing we haven't done in our headquarters, we haven't yet figured out how to do tattoo removal because the doctors are, it's such a small space and yeah. they haven't figured it out, but they will. And, uh, but you know, I've, I've done two double funerals uh, from COVID, a homie and his father, and then a homie's mom and grandmother. And, uh, and it's not every day that you do double funerals. You know, I mean, it's kind of a remarkable thing. And, and, and I just know uh, countless folks who, because they're disproportionately impacted by the, by the virus, because they're, you know, they're in these essential worker positions. And so uh, the risk level gets higher. And what about you? I know that you had, um, um, you know, some, some health challenges and, and how are you keeping yourself safe? Well, you know, I'm fine. You know, I have leukemia, but I, you know, and I've been battling it for a lot of years and I've been really fortunate not to have to battle it uh, uh, since March. So, um, and the last treatments I got were um, radiation. And so, but so far so good, but uh, you know, the homies are kind of, I just go with it. I surrender to it. You know, they, they they've put me in a kind of a tent, a little casbah that's in the, uh-huh parking lot because they refuse to let me in the building because they think somehow, well, you know, it's, it's, it's a tent that's very airy and it's yeah. like being outside essentially. So, so they really monitor who goes, uh, how they people go into my tent. So they're, they're more protective of me than I would be. So, but I'm just going with it. Are you finding, I mean, you mentioned that there's been, you know, um, a, a large number of, of incarcerated folks have been released from prisons in California. Governor Newsom has released many in, in part to to prevent the spread of, of COVID. Um, and you mentioned that many of, of those who are incarcerated show up at your doorstep. Um, given given the fact that there's been a release of, of a high number of, of prisoners and also the fact that the economy has been in, in, in a crisis, um, are you finding you know, just swelling numbers of people who are looking to become part of of the organization and, and to work? Oh, yeah, there's no, uh, that has not relaxed in any way at all. So we're, we're still inundated because they were kind of the only game in town, you know, where people come and wanting to reimagine their lives. To say nothing of the fact that, you know, we're, we're at three, looks like we'll be at 300 hem- homicides in, uh, in LA uh, come the end of the year. And we haven't had that since 2009. Wow. Now, in 1992, we had a thousand. So um, so we have cut it in half and cut it in half again. So, but this is, a, it's a rise. And it, again, it's if, if our diagnosis is steady, which is, this is about a lethal absence of hope. And obviously, you know, the economy and the virus have impacted that hope or lack thereof. So, you know, we need to uh, infuse hope where hope is foreign. And, uh, and that will go a long way to make the streets safer. But uh, I've, I've buried a lot of homies uh, killed during this time of pandemic, which uh, wasn't so much true before it. Wow. Um, Father Greg, I want to bring in some questions from our audience. Um, this is from Rohan Shah um, via Facebook, and Rohan's in North Carolina, and asks, do you think some of the training programs uh, for, uh, you know, for, for, for that, that you're engaged in could actually begin in prison? Yeah, they could. I mean, prisons, you know, should shift to from punishment to, you know, to be more restorative for sure. We've been invited in once uh, there was a warden who was very progressive who wanted to give Homeboy Industries a whole pod, you know, a whole section of the prison. But we kind of feel like uh, it's a little bit like rehab. You know, if you force people into rehab, it doesn't really work. 
And uh, so we always say, you know, walk through our doors and we got you. But, but you kind of have to walk through our doors. Our program is not for those who need it. It's only for those who want it. Certainly prisons could do better than they're doing. And instead of just warehousing, they could be helpful. But, uh, you know, there's something about, you know, kind of walking through the door and choosing that, that's, um, you know, fuller and, and more whole. Yeah. I, um, I, I heard you talk about um, this concept of radical kinship uh, in, in a TED talk you gave, finding connection and, and common ground with strangers. Um, how, how does that idea steer your leadership? Well, kinship is the whole goal. You know, uh, if I could uh, get sort of uh, biblical here, you know, Jesus says that you may be one. You know, it's, it's not about, that's the whole goal and uh, that we belong to each other. So you want to create a, a community of beloved belonging. You know, the great John Lewis says, we all live in the same house. And it, that's not an aspiration. It's not one day we might. Or some people live in the basement and some people live on the third floor. No, we all live in the same house. So you, you want to kind of uh, always, so Homeboy tr tries to be the front porch of the house everybody wants to live in, a place of radical kinship, of exquisite mutuality where there is no us and them. That's the whole goal, uh, you know, even in, in terms of our own uh, country's belief, you know, a, a more perfect union. That's what it's about. So that's always the goal. And, um, you know, Homeboy is a solution, I guess, but it's also a sign. It, it, it doesn't want to point stuff out. It wants to point to something. It wants to point to, you know, what if we uh, really believed that we belong to each other? And yeah. that, that's a, a game changer once we believe it. Father Greg, this year has been a year filled with grief for so many people. You, 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 you mentioned all the funerals that you have presided over. Um, how do you, how do you counsel people to deal with grief when, 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 when people are grieving and when people are also under incredible emotional pressure from everything that they have been going through this year, what are ways that you have found work to help people cope? Well, you want to put everything in its place. You want to live as though the truth were true, and you want to put first things recognizably first. So, so in terms of death, you know, if, if death is the worst thing that can happen to you, then you're going to be toppled by life itself. So you want to be able to put it in its place, you know. But with grief, I'm, there's a lot of grief that sort of come, you know, our, our lives are disrupted, but our our, our entire identities in many ways are, are torpedoed. So you have to lean into the grief and you have to find yourself curious about it. And then pretty soon you're savoring and then you're relishing. And then all of a sudden you're being led to joy. That really happens if you do those things. Because then you're anchored in the present moment, in the here and now, and you're delighting in, in who's right in front of you. And, and that's the whole goal again, could get biblical, you know, my joy, yours, your joy complete. That's the whole ball game. And, and, and related to the earlier thing about kinship, that's where the joy is. So we're always trying to get to joy. And, and, and like the marriage vows, you know, in good times and in bad and sickness and in health, it's joy in all those circumstances. So it doesn't really matter how things turn out. Uh, joy is possible right here and now, no matter what's happening. And, and I think that's sort of the secret of life. Um, before I let you go, I want to ask you to put on your entrepreneur hat again. I know you're a reluctant entrepreneur, but, but you are. <laughs> but you are. You, you've created a bunch of social enterprises and have, have in, inspired many others. Um, when, when somebody comes to you, a former gang member, and, and says, hey, you know, I want to start a business, but I'm not sure if now is a good time to do it. We get that question from all kinds of entrepreneurs all the time. What's your response to that question? What do you think? Is now, is now a good time to, to try to start something despite the challenges that we are living in and under? 
Well, I had a homie come see me just last week and he wanted to start a nonprofit, you know, to kind of vaguely help youth. And I said, wow, you know, that's really hard. In fact, you might even say it's impossible. And he said, what are the two words in that word impossible? He said, I'm possible. And I said, well, he kicked my butt on that one. And, and I guess, you know, it's just hard when people ask me, especially about food related things, because it's so hard, you know, have a restaurant stay open. And I always say, don't try this at home, but it, it's like, you know, th this is a hard time, although, you know, you, you can look around and you can see, you know, what does the world need at the moment from mask to hand sanitizer. And uh, we've kind of moved into a, a hiring relationship with a huge organic hand sanitizer company that, you know, they've just opened up three more warehouses. So who knows? I don't know these things and I'm the first to admit it, but, uh, but, you know, we have a solar panel training program and we've had three homies start their own uh, solar panel installation program, you know, businesses mm -hmm. on their own. So we, we have had experiences of, and, you know, I've had homies who have started their own industrial kind of commercial cleaning services. So, you know, but I, I'm the least likely person to know very much about the time in which we live and what businesses or or how sensible is it to start something father greg uh thank you so much for uh joining us uh it's been a pleasure my privilege thank you um and thank you all for um watching we are going to be back here uh, with another live resilience interview next thursday at this time noon eastern uh, 9 a.m pacific right here join us next thursday um also, our most recent episode of How I Built This dropped on Monday. It is the story of Dropbox with Drew Houston, the founder of Dropbox. It's a really, really cool story. Next week, we have a new one, the story of Kenneth Cole, um, an amazing uh, fashion brand and entrepreneur, Kenneth Cole. You're going to love that story. Also, just last month, my book, How I Built This, was published. If you love this show, if you're interested in, in starting a business or in the thick of it or simply want to be inspired by people who have already done it, uh, check out the How I Built This book. It is available everywhere you buy books. Um, Father Greg, once again, thank you so much. Thanks, Kai. All right. Bye, everybody.